is here today. He is a missionary in Papua New Guinea. And see a helicopter on the slide there. That's how he gets to his house. <laughs> That's how he goes home because there's not a road. So uh, he'll tell you all about that. Zach is out of Grace Bible Church in Tempe, Arizona. A very like-minded church uh, to the RBC, and when uh, our when Hope was getting treatments last fall down in Phoenix, we were there on two Sundays. Both times we were able to uh, worship there at Grace Bible Church, and they welcomed us and were very uh, gracious, and we we experienced wonderful fellowship there. And it's important. Uh, a couple of reasons I'm excited about today. One is the RBC has a responsibility to and the privilege of um, participating in the pursuit of the obedience of the Great Commission. And so this is an opportunity for us to uh, learn about and partner with uh, a missionary on the field uh, that we, we know their home, his home church and the, the ministry there. So, so I'm excited about about that, but then there's also just the aspect of partnership with like-minded churches, churches who believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, uh, are committed to that. They don't just, as Zach and I talked about, they just say that, you know, on their website, uh, but there are churches who are, who are applying that, living that out, and uh, Grace Bible Church is one. They're part of the Expositors Network. Uh, and, and so they're very like-minded to us, and I think it's very important during these days that we have strong relationships with other churches who are of like faith and practice, uh, and when I say that, I don't mean just generally, very specifically of like faith and practice, and so I very much appreciate this opportunity today. Uh, so Zach's with us. He's uh, going to be sharing about his work there in Papua New Guinea, and then also he'll be preaching the Word of God for us in our in our uh, worship meeting. He is married to Cassidy. How long have you been married? <laughs> Twelve years. And uh, three children, four children. One is due here July 1st, which is the reason uh, Cassidy is, is not here uh, with us in St. George. Uh, she's preparing for the little one to come. But uh, he also has Jude, age 11, Oliver, age 9, and Annie, age 1. And uh, he'll tell you more about his, his missions. That's what he's here for, his mission work. But I'd like to pray for us, and then uh, Zach can come and, and uh, tell us about how God is at work in your life and ministry. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for this opportunity that we have. I pray that you would work in our hearts to accomplish your will for your glory and our blessing. I thank you that for your people, as you are glorified, your people are blessed, and you mean good for us, and you have for all eternity. Uh, no matter what's going on in the world, um, that cannot change, and we thank you for that. Thank you for the gospel, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Jesus. Father, you are good and gracious to us, and we Bless Zach, Cassidy, Jude, Oliver, Annie, and the little one on the way. And bless this ministry. Uh, may souls be saved for your glory in Papua New Guinea, and in St. George, and Tempe, and everywhere. Uh, be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name. It's a privilege to be with you all this morning. Uh, I, 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 when I think of Utah, I think of the mission field. So my, my only connection to St. George is that when I was really young, like seven, eight, nine, my mom used to come up, well, my, my family used to come up here because my mom would run in the St. George Marathon uh, every year. So, and my dad loved Zion National Park, so we used to come out and, and see this area and so when I had the opportunity to come and speak here, I told my parents about it. I called them. They're in uh, uh, Kentucky. 
Um, and I, so I, I called them and I was like, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm going to St. George. I'm going to preach. And they're like, have you converted to something that we should know about? Um, I said, no, there actually is a like-minded church in Utah. So we just like, we praise the Lord for you guys. Um, this, is a, this is a mission field in and of itself. I, it was such a privilege yesterday to sit down and get to know Pastor Michael and what he's been doing here, church planting um, in, in Utah. It's just so similar. The, the mission is the same no matter where you go. Whether you're in the jungles of Papua New Guinea or whether you're in the deserts of Utah, the mission is the same. People need to hear the Word of God. Um, and that's actually what I want to start with this morning is to preach just a little bit. It's going to be short. Um, and just talk about what the Bible says about missions. So I'm going I'm to do that first. We'll start with just what is what does the Bible say about missions? And then I want to show you then what we're doing. So what does the Bible say? How does that then apply to what we're doing in Papua New Guinea? And then, um, and then maybe if there's time at the end, I can open it up for questions. If you guys have any, uh, we can keep it casual. I need to end by... 10, 15, is that right? Ish. Okay. All right. I, you know, living in Papua New Guinea, time is not my strong suit. You know, they don't, they don't do anything uh, according to time there. So uh, let's turn to Romans 10. If you have your Bibles with you, let's open up to Romans chapter 10. Uh, this, as you know, is probably one of the most famous sections in the Bible, except for maybe the Great Commission in Matthew 28, a famous section on... Uh, the need for missionaries, the need to send people all over the world to tell others about the good news of Jesus. This is from the pen of the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, who left the borders of Israel to bring the good news of Jesus into the Roman Empire. Um, and in fact, the book of Romans, I don't know if you've ever realized this, the book of Romans is basically a inspired missionary support letter. I mean, Paul is writing this to the Roman church, and he says, hey, I'm so excited to share the gospel with you. Then he spends 14, 15 chapters talking about the glory of the gospel, and he says, I just want to make sure we're on the same page, because I'm really hoping to be encouraged in the gospel and to be sent on my way by you to Spain. So Paul's headed to Spain, and he writes this letter to this church in Rome, um, really to seek support, to make sure they're on the same page about the same things. Uh, and in this letter... Uh, in chapter 10, Paul outlines uh, the wonderful gift of the gospel and how it gets to those who have never heard about Jesus. Uh, God saves sinners through the sending of preachers to those who have never heard the good news of Jesus. So we'll start in Romans 10, um, verse 9. And verse 9, I, it's, it's a little awkward to start here. It starts with the word because, so we're starting mid-sentence. Basically, this argument here... Paul is essentially saying why. He's answering the question that began in chapter 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not per, uh, pursue righteousness have received it. They've attained it. They've gotten the righteousness of God. They weren't even trying, and they got it for free. Meanwhile, the Jews who had the law, um, they pursued it, but it, they did not succeed in reaching the righteousness that the law required. And he, in verse 32, he's like, why? Well, because they did not... Uh, pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on their works. So they're they're trying in their own strength, apart from faith in God, to achieve something, to achieve righteousness for themselves. In chapter 10, verse 4, he says, Christ is the end of that kind of law-keeping. Law-keeping for righteousness, if you're going to talk about being good and attaining salvation through your goodness, then you're not talking about what Jesus Christ has done. Jesus Christ is the end of that type of law-keeping. And then in verse Nine, he says, here's why. It starts with because. Here's why. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And m many of you probably have that verse memorized. It's a, it's a popular one. Um, and at first glance, it looks like God might not be at work in these verses. It might seem like this is highlighting what a person does. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead... It's you, you, you. You know, is, you know, is Paul being man-centered here? Um, I don't think so. I think if we look at these verses, we'll find that this verse actually offends our flesh on two counts. Um, first, it defends our desire to save ourselves. Uh, worldly thinking takes issue with statements like this. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. And I think our flesh says, 
That, that's it? That's so simple. That's so, it's too easy. Isn't there more that you have to do? Tell me there's some step you have to take, something really hard, um, some trial to go through before you can attain to the righteousness of God. And the answer is no. Um, when, when our flesh says, but anyone could do that, then, well, that's exactly right. The gospel is about what God has done in sending his son, crushing his son, accepting the sacrifice made by his son, and then raising his son from the grave. That's the work that God does and God alone. And there's nothing left for a person to do but trust that work. That's what's left. Confess and believe. Now, there, there's another error, another way in which this might offend us. Um, and that is that there's this desire in our flesh for easy grace, cheap grace. Oh, great, all I have to do is say something. I just have to say the words, Jesus is Lord. Believe in my heart that God raised from the dead. Like, that's so easy. Like, that makes missions super easy. Just go and force people to say these words. Just say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Just say, yes, you believe. Yes, I believe. Done. We have converts. Right? Why is, uh, why does this verse not teach that? Uh, this verse offends our flesh that loves cheap grace. Our, our flesh might think, I can just confess and I'm in. Um, but it's not really that simple or that easy. In, in Romans 1.21, Paul says that even though God has made himself known in creation, people did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but instead became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The human heart is wicked. It's darkened. Um, how can a heart like that actually truly believe that God has done something on their behalf? That heart hates God. How is that heart going to believe God? Consider what Romans says about the mouth. In Romans 3, 12 to 14, Paul writes, No one is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. No one does good, and all have mouths that are filled to the brim with the stench of dishonesty, rebellion, bitterness. How does a mouth like that come to confess that Jesus is Lord? It takes the work of God. I love what one commentator says of this verse in Romans 9. He says, anyone can, of course, utter the words. What Paul is saying is that to know that Jesus is the Lord is ultimately not a human discovery. It is something revealed by the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I'm sure all of you have evangelized, have tried to share the gospel with people out there. Do you find people to just be eager to submit themselves to the Lordship of Christ? Do you find people like, yeah, this is great. I, I want a boss over my life. I want there to be a Lord and Master. This is great. Thank you. Thank you for witnessing to me. Uh, it's not my experience with evangelism. Um, it, it, it takes a supernatural work of the Lord. And so this is the good news that we preach, brothers and sisters. It, it's amazing. It's at once both incredibly simple and impossible. And I, and I love that it's those two things. There, there is nothing left for us to do to be saved. Christ has done everything required. And it is just impossible for human beings on their own to receive that message. Human beings on their own hate God. They hate submitting to God. They want to do things on their own terms. They would rather not be handed the righteousness of God by a, a substitute, a savior. They would rather work their own way. They would rather be good enough on their own terms. And that's just wicked. And that's where people are. And Paul points out that this is true for Jews and non-Jews alike. They're all in the same boat when it comes to this. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Whether they speak Hebrew or Greek or Latin or French or English or Melanesian Pigeon in Papua New Guinea, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's amazing. This offer is for everybody. This offer of salvation applies to everybody because all people are in the same boat. If you're ministering to someone here in St. George or if I'm ministering to someone in a village in Papua New Guinea, the heart that we're addressing is just the same. They're the same people with the same problems, with the same rebellion, the same sin, and they need the same Savior. 
But then comes the questions in verse 14 of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. And Paul's addressing, what about those who haven't heard? What about those who haven't heard? And notice how all these questions that Paul asks are how questions. These are questions of means, how to get something done. People are, I, I have a degree from a university in missiology and the study of missions, and people are so confused. My professors, so many of them, were so confused about how to do missions. There's thousands of theories, thousands of strategies, and they're like, well, I don't know. You know, we can try this or this, and how much do you contextualize, and how much do you do this, and some of the questions are good, but there's so much confusion. No one seems to know how to do missions. And then you read Romans 10, and Paul's like, how, 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 how? Four times. Here's how. You want to know how to do missions? Four questions. How, then, will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So make each of those questions a statement. You probably noticed, but there's the answer to the question is in the question. So, uh, if you know, how will they hear unless someone preaches? Well, send someone to preach so that they can hear. Right? The answer is just Paul's given it to them in the question. The question's there to help them think through it. Um, if you if you change those questions into s- statements and you just follow the logic back up the chain, you see Paul's mission plan. And it's this. Local churches need to send preachers so that they can preach, so that people can hear God's word, so that they can trust in God, so that they can actually call on him, so that they can be saved. That's the mission. This is the way it works, whether you are Jewish or Roman or American or Chinese or Papua New Guinean, that's the way it works. And that ought to be the aim of every missionary. And granted, there are missionaries, some are pilots, some are administrators, some are teachers. But if the aim of these people that we send out, if the aim of missionaries is not ultimately that God's word be preached, then what you're involved in is not actually the missions described in the Bible. And that ought to be the aim of every missionary, to get God's word to people. The preacher is necessary. Um, but then, then a problem shows up in verse um, uh, 16. So right after we get this wonderful statement, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. A quote from Isaiah. This is just a declaration of Yahweh himself. If good news is preached, it has Yahweh's approval. Uh, you know, if you're an evangelist or a church planner, or if you've gone out, chances are the people you're ministering to do not go, I just love your message. I love what you're doing. This is great. Beautiful feet. It's not what you hear. Uh, this is a declaration from God himself. He thinks those feet are beautiful. It's his mission. He's the one building his church. He's the one getting this done. The Lord loves the proclamation of his word. And then in verse 16, though, we get this this but. Uh, Something's wrong. There's an objection here. Uh, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And of course, Paul would turn to Isaiah, who just had a really troubled ministry. Not many people listened to Isaiah. And the Lord told him from the outset, you're going to go preach, and not a lot of people are going to listen to you. But do it anyway, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, That's a tough ministry. Paul knew it. I think one of the reasons he uses uh, kind of a past tense here, um, they have not all believed the gospel. He just knows from experience. He's traveled from city to city to city. He knows they have not all obeyed the gospel. Um, This happens everywhere. And I was talking to Pastor Michael, and I felt it too. There's oftentimes discouragement as you see the church grow slowly. Or maybe shrink at times, you know, the people in your influence, the people who are listening. It doesn't grow very fast. Some people just aren't willing to listen. Um, Sometimes you get persecuted 
like we all have rocks thrown at you, get thrown into prison. I think it's at that point that we start asking the question, is this really, is this mission really working? Maybe, maybe there's something better to do. So we tried this mission, Paul, sending out preachers, preaching the gospel. It's not really working. Is there another option? Is there another solution to the, the bringing God's word to the nations? Verse 17, I think, is Paul's answer. All right, so what are we going to do? So, so how does this work? What are we going to do since we're being persecuted? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Nothing changes. That objection changes nothing. People don't listen, and it's okay. What do you do? You still preach the word. You don't change. You don't go and move on to another type of ministry. You, you preach the word. Uh, and I love that lest the preacher feel too important or the missionary feel too important about themselves, the, the missionary in that verse almost vanishes. It's people need to hear God's word. And then God has to open their ears to hear it so that they can believe and be saved. That's what has to happen. The missionary is just a conduit. Um, I don't get to go to Papua New Guinea and say whatever I want to say, start whatever I want to start, do whatever I want to do. If I'm going to be faithful to God's word, I'm just my job is just to make sure that this gets to them. And then, Lord willing, the Lord will save people. And that's what we pray for and hope for and long for. And, uh, and we have seen the Lord doing that. Uh, let me transition now from that to kind of how that plays out in, in our own ministry in Papua New Guinea. Um, so, Papua New Guinea, we'll start with, let's see if I can get this to work, perfect. Papua New Guinea, where is it? Do you guys know where Papua New Guinea is? You know, you guys have maps of the persecuted world on your, uh, on your uh, bulletin boards out there. I love that. I grew up with Voice of the Martyrs, too. And I didn't know where Papua New Guinea was because Papua New Guinea does not show up on persecuted charts because it actually is a Christian country. There aren't many Christians there, but it's Christianized. Um, there's, there's lots of different denominations there, a um, lot of uh, syncretism, yeah, taking Christianity as a, as a means to a uh, selfish end. You know, it's prosperity gospel, but packaged in a more animistic way. Um, so Papua New Guinea, it is down there right above uh, us, or right up above Australia. Um, so it's, it's a little island. We work in some rugged mountains in Papua New Guinea. They're called the Finisterre Mountains. Finisterre is uh, just a, I think the French were there uh, and named these mountains, and they called it Finisterre, which is Fini, the end, and Terre, the earth. It's just the end of the earth, as far as the French were concerned. So we're we're in these in these rugged mountain uh, rugged mountains. There's no roads uh, for miles. Um, we do have a a road. It, it can be traversed if you've got a big enough machine to go on it. Um, it's about 12 miles away from our village. Um, there's rarely a tractor working that can maneuver that road. So we're we're about a 16 hour or 14 hour hike to the beach. Um, out of the mountains, down to the coast, and then the next day you can usually take a, a small dinghy uh, across the bay to the nearest town. So we're, we're a couple days away from civilization. Uh, that's our, our village where we work. It's called Mawerero. Um, that is uh, actually two words. Ma is their word for sweet potato, and Werero is their word for to sleep. So it's the place where sweet potato sleeps. Uh, they're really proud of their sweet potatoes. They grow really well um, in, uh, in, this, in this particular area. Uh, this is our little team. So that's my wife, Cassidy. Um, our, our oldest, tallest son there is Jude. Uh, and then Oliver standing in front of me. And uh, little baby Annie, who joined our team uh, a year ago, year and a half ago. And, uh, yeah, we, we've been in Papua New Guinea for almost 10 years. Um, we've had a series of teammates we went over with another family. Um, that family ended up having to come back to the States for some health issues for their kids. And then while they were back, they found out that uh, the dad had um, lung cancer. 
um, and he passed away um, just a, a few months after that. So we lost our first teammates almost immediately. They helped us go to Papua New Guinea, and we built houses together in, in the village of Mairoro, uh, and then they were out of the picture. We got new teammates from South Africa, of all places, um, and they joined our team. They stayed with us for four years through language learning and getting to the gospel. Um, but then through some family <coughs> issues of their own, they've had to depart. So the Cans, this, our family, were kind of it in the village at the moment. Um, and just trusting the Lord. You know, he, I would love it if he would send more laborers. Um, but he has us there, and, and we keep plotting. So, um, you know, we, we make our plans, and the Lord directs our steps. That's just the, the end of it, isn't it? I mean... The way the Lord is going about bringing the gospel to these mountains, to these people, is not the way I would plan to do it. He's doing it a different way. Um, and it's his church to build. And, and, if, and if he wants to do it through our weakness and frailty and our failed plans, um, that's, that's his doing. Uh, the Doe people, uh, where we work, this, these are just some pictures of them. I just want to introduce you to them. They are, they are really poor and really hard workers. Uh, they, they live on these steep mountain slopes. Um, in, uh, in one of those pictures, you see a group of guys hiking up a trail, carrying uh, a piece of timber. I mean, they just go out into the jungle, they cut down trees, they, there's no road, so everything has to be done on foot. They hike everything everywhere. Um, their gardens are all on these really steep hillsides, too steep for me to walk down. I mean, I slip all the time. The people hate it when I come and visit them in their gardens because they feel responsible for my safety. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just a, they, they've got really hard lives. Uh, the women especially. Um, you can see a lady there. She's carrying a uh, sweet potato for her family. Uh, that's She's probably carrying 30, 40 pounds of sweet potato. And then on top of that, she's carrying firewood for her family. Ladies do all the heavy lifting. Um, the men will... Uh, clear gardens. The men will build houses and build bridges or whatever else is needed for them. Um, but the women do the heavy lifting. Uh, they just have very, very difficult lives. Um, I, uh, w when we first went there, I, these mountains are just so different than anything I've experienced. And I was hiking with them and I had a backpack and I just can't make it through these mountains carrying my own backpack. So, the guys realized that, and they offered to carry my bag. And I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. I, I mean, I can't physically do it, so sure, here. So I gave it to one of the guys. He proceeds within about 10 minutes to take my backpack and put it on top of the stuff his wife is already carrying back to the village. So she's got, like, coconuts that she's carrying from the village, probably about 40, 50 pounds of that. Then she's got firewood. Then my backpack on top of that. I've never been so ashamed in my life. Like, I, culturally, it's, it's just a very different place. Uh, the Doe people are animistic. Um, that just means they believe in spirits. They believe there are spirits in everything, from trees to rocks to bushes to the graveyards. Um, they are clan-oriented, so everyone has their own property that they think is theirs. And they believe their ancestral spirits guard that property. And if thieves come in, they get sick, and vice versa, if they do things wrong. It's just they explain their world through, through evil spirits. Um, in, the, in the picture, with the kids kneeling on the ground, you see they're, they're covered in white. That's actually ash from a fire. Um, this is just an example, one example of how um, Christian stories mixed with animism is incredibly dangerous. So they've heard of this repent in sackcloth and ashes. Um, in their animistic mind, they think, okay, so the way to appease God is I need to feel really sorry for what I've done. I need to put this ash all over my skin. And if we kneel down and we're really sorry about what we've done, then, about what we've done, then God will remove all sickness and disease and poverty from us. Um, so it's just a... It's, car it's cargo cult. It's um, prosperity gospel, um, but just with uh, animistic flavor to it. Uh, in our village, <clears throat> there's a church building. So this is a picture taken of a, a Lutheran church service that's taking place in our village. And I remember sitting there 
And I mean, they're reading the Bible every Sunday in the in the trade language. There, Melanesian pigeon. They are saying the Apostles' Creed. Um, they're saying the Lord's Prayer. I mean, it's all liturgy. But I'm like, Man, what am I doing here? Like, it seems like they've got access to a lot of truth. Um, and you know, my goal was to go somewhere unreached. And here I show up in this remote village, and they've got a, a church building. Doesn't feel very unreached. Uh, but then I start talking to the people, finding out. Okay, so you say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Maker of heaven and earth. Tell me about God the Father. What do you What do you know about Him? And I just remember, I asked one of the the leaders in the church that question, and he said. You know, Zach, we don't really know. I would love it if you would tell us which mountain does he live on? Is he on that mountain over there? Or does God live on that mountain over there? We know the Holy Spirit lives down by the river because the Holy Spirit likes to hover over the waters. That's their view of the world. They've just taken what they believed before and they just think that Christianity is the latest secret to get at what they really love, which is not God. It's stuff and an easy life. I mean, the same things that our flesh loves. They just want pleasure and less suffering. Um, so yeah, we, we came in in 2014. Um, this was a picture of uh, me on a survey hike when I hiked through a bunch of different villages. And I just offered, like, listen, this is what we are offering. I, I will, if you want to invite me, I will come in. I will live with you. I will learn your language and culture. Um, I will teach you how to read and write um, in your own language uh, because God's Word is in a book, so you should learn how to read so you can read God's Word. And I will translate God's Word for you into your language, and I'll teach it to you. That, that, was, the, that was the offer that our team made when we first went in there. Uh, the, the village of Myroro, they speak a language called Do. Uh, they invited us to come in, and so... We started the process of learning their language and culture. That is uh, the, the first house that we built there. And then there's pictures of my wife and I down below just learning language. Um, this language was not written down when we first uh, went in. So, And the people are illiterate. Um, there's no textbook on how to learn the Doe language. Uh, you just have to figure it out. So I learned really quick how to say, what is this? Uh, Nando, what is this? And then I just start pointing to things. I'm like, Nando. And they're like, take home. And I'm like, Nando. And they're like, take home. And I point at a tree. Nando. And they're like, take home. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, take home is their word for leaf. And they don't know what else to call this. It, the closest thing they know is it looks kind of like the leaves on a tree. Um, so a book, a piece of paper, and tree leaves are all take home. Um, and you just kind of learn. You learn You learn nouns first. You just find the name for everything. You know, Nando, and they say K, and you realize that means wood. You know, Nando, and they say Noko, and you learn that means ground. And you just kind of learn the nouns, the words for everything. After that, you start learning little phrases. How do you say um, my leaf? Uh, how do you say your piece of ground? How do you say, you know, and you learn, you start adding little bits of meaning to their to their language. Uh, and then you learn how to use sentences. Um, this is my ground. That's your ground. Uh, this is my tree. That's your tree. Uh, then you learn their economics. You start asking them questions like, where did you get your ground? Uh, where did you get this knife or this um, machete or whatever it is that they have? And they'll start telling you about economics. Where do they get things? How do they perceive possessions? Um, what are their ideals in, in life? What are their principles that they live by? And then eventually you get to worldview level questions where you start asking, where did paper come from? Where did leaves come from? Where did trees come from? Where did uh, wood come from and ground? Like, how did all this start? Do you know where this started? Um, and in that process, you not only learn language, but at the same time you just learn culture. You learn how people think and how they're processing the world around them. Um, and then after that, we took their language and we helped them develop an alphabet um, and started teaching them to read and write. And up there, there's a picture of the first literacy class that graduated back in uh, 2000 um, or 2020 during, during the, the pandemic. 
Um, and then um, I started translating God's word and preaching it. Um, basically taking what I had learned, and I said, okay, I've lived with you now. I think I've been there five years at this, uh, six years almost at this point. And I said, I've lived with you for so long. I, I know the things that you're thinking. And I said, you, you believe this, right? You believe that you come from uh, nature, that your ancestors are actually part of um, the ground. There, I heard stories where people would say, my, my ancestors came from that tree. That tree is sacred. Our ancestors came from that. The spirit of that tree uh, impregnated someone somewhere, and then those children are us. We're, we're the descendants of that tree. There's guys I met who are like, that stone right there, that's where my ancestors are from. And so I'm like, you believe this, right? And they're like, yes, yes, exactly. That's right. We believe that. Okay. And you're Lutheran. Yes, that's right, Zach. We are also Lutheran. So you believe it's the Bible only that's true. Yes, absolutely, Zach. That's right. Okay. Well, the Bible says we are all from Adam and Eve. All of us. And then all from Noah after that. Like, we are, we are all a part of the same family. We're all human beings. And yes, we, we look different. We've got different cultures. We live in different places. But we're all part of the same family. And we all have the same problem. That's what the Bible says. So, he, so here's what you think. And here's what the Bible says. And they're not the same. And I just taught... 53 lessons that way, uh, from Genesis through to Revelation, and we just walked through the biblical story all the time, highlighting, here's what you guys believe, and here's what the Bible says. They're not the same. They don't agree with one another. They're not meshable. So what are you going to do? Are you going to believe what your ancestors told you is true, or are you going to believe, are you going to be good Lutherans and believe the Bible? And... Man, that was just not a popular message. Uh, we live in a village of about 500 uh, people. And I would say the very first lesson, about 200 people came because they were just really curious. Uh, some people are just afraid of us. Um, some people are just not interested in what we've come to do. Uh, they would much rather I build them roads and provide them with solar panels and stuff like that. So, um, But about 200 people came and they were curious. The next day, I think we were down to 100 people. Uh, the day after that, I think we were down to like 75. The day after that, we were down to 50. And it just kind of went that way. We, we settled at about 50 people uh, on any given day. And I just taught for three months straight for one hour every morning, going through the biblical story and being like, this is what's true. This is how to be saved. This is how to care about things that are eternal and not just about things that are temporary. Uh, even if I came and brought you all the wealth and the comfort that you desire, you're still going to die. You're still going to be buried in that graveyard. Your soul, per uh, Ecclesiastes 12, is going to go back to the Father and be judged. What are you going to do then? How are you going to find the help that you actually need? Of the 50 that came, I would say there were probably about 20 who were actually eager to hear God's word and hungry. And to our best guess, we may have 20 believers in our village. We may have as little as five. I don't know. It's somewhere in there. We've got a variety of uh, confessions of faith in the Lord. Time will tell as they bear fruit. But um, it's, it's a small crowd. And the temptation to do something different is strong. The temptation to want to make the gospel more palatable. Uh, to offer things that people will be more excited about. It's tempting. And I just, I have to come back to Romans 10 and remind myself, wait, so what do I do when it's not going the way I hoped it would go? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. God just has to do a work. He has to open ears. He has to help them hear his word. And if they hear it and believe it, then they can call on him who can save them. And he will. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, our work now is basically this charge from 2 Timothy 2.2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, uh, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
So now there are people who have heard from me the, the, the gospel, and I'm kind of working to train up guys who can do the same thing after me. And they're going to be better at it. My dough is so poor. I, I, I probably, I mean, the people remind me all the time how bad I sound in their language. It's going to be so much better. I, let's see if I, I do a uh, time for an anecdote. So I first saw this in literacy as we were teaching people how to read and write. Um, imagine trying to explain to someone who has never read before what a period is. What a period does. It's, it's a mark that's on your page, but you don't say it. But it has a lot of meaning, right? And I mean, and you, in your own mind, just try to think, how would you define a period? It's the end of a sentence. Okay, well, they don't have sentences, so it's the end of a thought. Um, you know, you just have to start thinking. So I'm trying to figure out, how do I explain this? And so I came up with this long explanation. And in class, you could just tell it's not communication. You know, I'm really trying hard, and I'm using what I think, they're all dope words, they're just probably not in the right order or something. I, the people are like looking at me like, we really want to understand you, but we just can't. And I'm like, well, it's this mark, it doesn't make any sound, but it's the end of a thought. You guys, uh, they conjugate the final verb in a sentence, um, and so the verb always comes at the very end of a dough sentence. So I'm like, it's right after that verb, there's going to be a mark, you don't say it, but you kind of pause, that's the end of that thought, and then you can move on to the next one. They're just looking at me, and they don't get it. And for several days, we just worked and reworked the explanation, trying to help them. I mean, these are literacy students. They have to learn how to read if they're going to have any chance at reading God's Word in their own language someday. So we keep trying, trying, trying. Finally, one day, a guy named Micah Pei, he gets it. He's like, oh. And Micah Pei then, in true uh, Papua New Guinean fashion, helps his friends out now. So... I'm standing there, or actually it was my wife teaching that class. She was trying to teach them how, like, what, how to read, write, what, it, what is the period. It's not going well. Finally, Mike Bay gets it, and he stands up, and in like two sentences, he says two sentences in dough. And everyone's like, oh, that's what, okay, all right, we got it now. And that was just a, a picture-perfect example why I don't want to be the long-term preacher in Papua New Guinea in this particular tribe. Like, I want to get them God's word in their own language. I want to teach them as best I can the truths of scripture. And I just want, I want a dough speaking guy to get it. A faithful guy to get it so that he can then communicate so much better than me. I mean, he understands the culture, the language, so much better. It, all he has to do, though, is understand this first. If he understands this, he'll be, he'll be faithful to communicate. So, um, yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, it's been a joy being with you guys. I think we're pretty much out of time, but feel free to come up and ask questions at some point if you have any. Um, I will put up this final slide. If you want to stay in touch, hear more, um, if you want to go to Papua New Guinea, if you've got that uh, willingness to go, I mean, there is a need for more laborers. There are 800 languages in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I only have the strength in me to learn one of those. Um, we need lots more workers. Um, so if you want to go, uh, there's information up there. My email, feel free to shoot me an email. If you want to get on our, our monthly email update list, uh, just jot down my email. Send me an email that says, hey, I would love to get your updates, and I'll, I'll add you to our list. Um, on, the, on the web, that's our mission organization's website, finistermission.org. And then we have a blog, Cans of Clay. Um, that's our last name, Cans. So it's got two N's. So it's not misspelled. That is how you have to spell it if you want to find it. Um, Cansofclay.com. And you can learn more about uh, our ministry there as well. But it's been a pleasure being with you this morning. And uh, I look forward to opening God's Word with you more uh, in the next service. Thank you, guys. It really is a miracle that we are the body of Christ uh, together way out here. You know, we might not be in the Finisterre Mountains, but we are pretty close to the ends of the earth. Like when you think about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then when you think about St. George, Utah, I mean, that's a long way. Uh, I googled it just now to see, like, is it farther from Jerusalem than Papua New Guinea? It's not. It was going to be a great anecdote if it was, but... Um, 
Yeah, uh, just amazing to see how the Lord builds His church uh, in in all corners of the world, and and what a privilege to be a part of that work. It's a privilege for me to be here uh, with you guys this morning. Uh, I do have to make sure I can see time, so I don't go too long. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, you know, people don't have watches, clocks. They don't they don't live that way. So. It's not uncommon for when I teach for people to show up to our meetings, you know, an hour, two hours late. Um, and to pay them back, I preach at them for one or two hours to make up for it. So uh, I won't do that to you this morning. Um, if you have a Bible, open it to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, I know that you guys are actually with Jason going through 1 Peter, so this is wonderful. That we get to stay with the same author, just look at the next letter. Um, we're going to look at the, the whole first uh, chapter of Second Peter today. And, and this is partly the strategy I use when I uh, preach in the Doe language in Papua New Guinea. I don't know Doe that well, and uh, sometimes in preaching, uh, I, I'm like, you know, if I, if I don't know how to say all the things that I want to say, at least I can just read more scripture, and that way I know I'm not saying false things. Uh, so we'll be looking at the, uh, the, the first chapter of, of 2 Peter chapter 1. This was actually the, the first sermon, uh, essentially, I mean, I've made edits, but the first sermon essentially that I preached in, in the Doe language. So I, uh, after I learned their language and culture um, and was ready to preach God's word to them, I was like, I really need to introduce God's word to them. Like, before we start in Genesis 1-1, which I really wanted to do, I want them to know who God is, and that he is the king of everything, and that he is the lord of the universe, the maker of it, um, and that we are his creation, and therefore we must submit to him. Um, he is the boss, and we are not. Uh, I wanted to get there, but I figured before I even start in Genesis 1-1, I kind of have to introduce what God's word even is. Um, and when I thought about it... Uh, I think uh, Second Peter, I, ironically, it's towards the end of the Bible, but I think it's a wonderful introduction to the Bible uh, and a wonderful invitation to read your Bibles because uh, there are lots of wonderful promises here. Um, I've been a, in, a missionary in Papua New Guinea for nearly a decade, um, and what stands out to me most um, is that when you get past all the, the strong language barriers and the unsavory cuisine and the strange customs and the syncretistic beliefs, um, what you find is that Papua New Guinea and its people are really just exactly what the Bible said they would be. Um, they are proud people living in defiance of their creator and suffering as a result of it. Uh, no different than the kinds of people that you'll find in St. George. Uh, lovers of self, disobedient to parents. You'll find thieves, liars, hypocrites, people who don't even live up to the standard of holiness that... Uh, they hold for themselves. Um, apart from God's grace, uh, people want to submit to their own standards uh, rather than the other way around. We don't want to submit to God. We want God to do things the way we think they should be done. We want him to forgive the sins that we think are forgivable. We want him to redeem the people that we think are redeemable. Uh, people, we tend to love ourselves. We love ourselves. We love ourselves on our own terms, and we want God to do that for us as well, uh, to love us on our own terms. Um, and this is just the pride of mankind, and it's true in St. George, it's true in Tempe, Arizona, it's true in Medang, Papua New Guinea, it's true everywhere. People are proud. And, uh, and because people are proud, you have about as many beliefs on how to attain salvation as you have people on the planet. Um, the human heart is capable of some really creative belief systems. Um, and they're varied. Beliefs And they lead to lots of confusion. And I, I think Satan must just love this. He's not content simply with persecuting the church from the outside. I think Satan loves it when there's confusion on the inside. And I think that's why Peter wrote two letters. You have First Peter, which is really an encouragement to the church to endure under persecution, to be ready, to stand for what's true. And then you have Second Peter, which is a caution, like, maybe you're the problem. There, there might be problems within the church. There might be. You might be sitting here thinking that because you do all these holy things, you're going to be saved, and you're not. Because we're only saved through what Christ has done, not through what we do. So he writes this 
letter. Um, you know, there's, there's confusion everywhere. People start to believe false things about God. Um, even in the church, people just start to reinterpret God. Maybe they have a favorite speaker or a favorite book. Or, and they, their view of God just shifts a little bit. Well, when your view of God shifts, your view of man has to shift too. And if our greatest problem is not that we are not at peace with our Creator, well, then you start coming up with other problems. There's other problems that we have to solve. And so you end up with other Gospels, um, new Gospels with new solutions to new problems. Um, and this gets so confusing. Um, you guys probably experience it. I mean, there's so many godly people, and they, some of the times they seem to be saying different things, and it can feel a bit like, how do I know it's true? And the, the people in our village in Papua New Guinea, they feel the same way. They, they've heard lots of different things, and they're still unsure. I mean, they... They, they follow all these different customs, but when I when I come to them point blank and ask them, "Will God accept you when you die?" When you die, will God really take you back to Himself or not? The the most common answer I get from people in the village is "Indica, I do not know." It's confusing that they, they do not know. It, have they met the standard or not? That's just the, the depravity of our hearts, is that we set these standards, we don't even keep those standards, and then we're just left like, have I done enough to make God happy or not? Um, it's very, it can be very confusing, and, and I think Second Peter chapter 1 is the perfect ballast to help us with those confusions. Um, in such a world with hearts such as ours, we might wonder, how, how are we going to make it? Everyone wants to make it in this life. And on to the next. And with so many solutions to accomplish these goals, it can be difficult to discern truth from error. There are so many clever, plausible, possible solutions, many of which parade under the banner of Christianity, unfortunately. But with stakes this high, the truth we ought to care about is not our own opinion or our best attempt at the truth or our truth. We ought to care about what is real and actual truth. I mean, we want to make it, don't we? Uh, I... It's just amazing to me that we are willing to settle for less than what is actually true. Settle for something that we think might be true when what's at stake is eternity and a right standing with our Creator. The Apostle Peter knew the importance of holding on to the truth, and he knew there were going to be challenges within the church, and so he writes this letter. Peter is writing this letter right at the end of his life. He's about to be let out of his prison cell and be executed by the Roman government. Jesus told Peter that he would eventually be led where he did not want to go. Uh, and sure enough, several extra-biblical sources record Peter's death by crucifixion under the rule of the ruthless Roman emperor Nero. And these are his final words. And I love how sometimes it's the most foundational truths that get us started that help us finish well in the end. Uh, these are the truths that he just comes back to as he's sitting in his cell. And, and I really want Peter to introduce this chapter to us. So for that, let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to actually look at verses 12 to 15. Because this is really, I think, why he's writing this letter. I mean, he's going to talk about false teachers and how to avoid them, the confidence that we can have in the scriptures. Um, but here's what he says in 2 Peter 1, 12 to 15. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I am going to make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall, to remember these things. So Peter wants his readers to be established, to remember the truth. Um, and, and having talked with Pastor Michael, I know that you guys love the truths of the Bible. That you guys want what you believe to be rooted and grounded here. Um, so I don't know that I'm going to teach you anything today, but I want to remind you, like Peter did, of some key truths. And these are just truths to help you make it. Truths to help you make it in this life and in the next Peter does not want the church to be swayed. He wants them 
to make it in a world filled with clever myths, plenty of false teachers. So he writes this letter so that any time they might be able to recall these things, he says, to recall these things. Now, what are these things? That's what this sermon is about. What are these things? Uh, we're going to fly through Second Peter chapter 1. We're not going to look at every detail, flip over every stone, though there are many, all of which are worthy of the time it would take to explore. Uh, but we're going to look at the flow of the whole first chapter, and we're going to observe uh, three key truths, three, three paragraphs, three key truths to help us make it in this life and the next. So these are reminders of truths to help you make it, three of them. Um, I'll give them to you ahead of time, in case you'd like an outline ahead of time. Uh, the first is going to be the sufficiency of your Savior, truth number one. Number two is going to be the hope that comes from holiness. And then lastly, we're going to look at the certainty that comes from the scriptures. So that's our outline. Let's, let's get at it. Peter does not have much of an introduction to this letter. Um, even in his brief greeting, he is moving straight for what he longs for most. There are no wasted words in these opening verses. Um, and I want you to just hear the love that this man has for his Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's, let's read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1-4. to four. You can follow along with me. This is Simon Peter, a servant, a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing as his divine power has granted, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has given to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That is Peter's opening greeting to the church. Uh, and even in this greeting, he's already hiding, uh, highlighting the absolute importance of Christ and knowing him. He calls himself, he starts off by calling himself a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. So slave, I mean, he is under Christ's authority. And tied to that for Peter is this idea of apostleship. Uh, he was physically with Jesus. He witnessed Jesus' ministry. Then he was saved by Jesus, sent out by Jesus to serve him in a very unique way as an authoritative witness of the promised Messiah. And Christ did all this to Peter. You don't look at Peter and say, man, this guy was worthy. And the Lord gave him a job. No, all this was done to him. Peter is often impulsive and vocal. And if you read through the Gospels, you realize that Jesus just does not listen to Peter. Doesn't listen to him, doesn't take his advice, doesn't go, that's a good idea, Peter. Right? Jesus is the one who is quick to encourage, redirect, rebuke Peter if necessary. Forgive Peter. And Jesus is the one who ultimately gives Peter his job to do. Feed my sheep, Jesus said to him. Jesus is the Lord, Peter's the slave, Jesus is the authority, Peter's the messenger. That much is clear. Now what about the audience? Peter writes... To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, ours being apostolic standing, those who have, e have a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is not to say that Peter thinks there are some Christians who have apostolic faith and some Christians who don't. You know, you've got the strong Christians and the backslidden Christians. That is not what Peter is saying. Peter is saying that if you are a believer, then you have received your faith by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, just like the apostles did. The apostles needed a Savior. They were sinners. They needed a Savior. There was only one. It's Jesus Christ. Faith in Him alone secures that, and it's the same for you. You might not have the job apostle. You don't have the job apostle. Uh... But your faith is no different than Peter's. The one you trust is no different than the person that Peter trusts. It's Jesus. Apostles don't have any more claim on the promises of God than you do. 
Any human being who has been saved by Christ has not been saved by any merit or worth that they possess, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Then Peter jumps right into his hope for his audience in verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So Peter wants those who believe in Jesus to have grace and peace in abundance. More grace, more peace than what they already have. Uh, just to give you a window into Bible translation, uh, I, I I have to translate the scriptures before I teach them. And a lot of times in language learning, what I find out is that they just don't have words for certain concepts that we have in English. Uh, there's no word in Do for grace. There's no word in Do for love. Uh, they've got no preposition that means in. So when you're trying to translate Ephesians and you come across in Christ, shows up like 30 some odd times in that letter. There's no way to just translate that in. I'm like, what's your word for in? They're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, you know, what's, what's your word for grace? I, I don't even know how to ask that question. And it really makes me wonder, like, and I've been, I've been raised in the church, Christian home. Uh, I go to Grace Bible Church. You would think I would know what grace is. And I, all of a sudden, I'm trying to figure out, like, how do I explain this? Like, wh what can I say to try to figure out how we're going to explain grace? Um, and so, just out of curiosity, do you know what grace is? Like, we sing about it. We talk about it. We preach about it. And do, do you know what grace is? Um, I'll just walk you through kind of how we discovered uh, how to talk about this in dope. Uh, grace is, uh, you know, you have to first find another definition, uh, an another way to say the same thing. Uh, one way we do it is by saying it's undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. So let's unpack that definition a little more. If you receive something good that's undeserved, you know what that means? That means you are undeserving. That means there's something wrong with you. And there is. You are evil and you are all going to die. Before I went to the mission field, I taught ancient history to middle schoolers at a, a public school in Phoenix. Um, and I told them that, listen, in ancient history, you're going to learn really just two things. Uh, everybody is evil and everybody dies. Everybody just looks out for themselves and given long enough, everyone passes on. No one stays on the world stage. Everyone we study in ancient history has been dead a very, very, very long time. It's a problem. And we all realize that, and all of our little systems and beliefs are trying to come up with our own solutions to those problems. A solution to our immorality, a solution to our mortality. Um, everyone's trying to fix these things. Everyone's evil, everyone dies. Everyone looks after themselves. No one lasts. The next word in Grace's definition is favor. So we're undeserving. We've got problems. We need help. And then comes this word, favor. This is the good thing that is offered. God is abounding in loving kindness. Later in this very book, Peter's going to write that God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So God is loving. He is kind. He's patient. Uh, he bestows favor on people. He's got a strong desire to help the helpless, and ultimately this is how we defined grace and dough. We called it free help. Free help. Samakam samakam tuwo. Free help. It's, it's help that you don't pay for. It's help that you don't earn. It's help that you don't deserve. You need help. Uh, and it's true of everyone. It's not just poor Papua New Guineans on the side of a mountain that need help. Every single human being walking this planet needs help. They are not right with their creator. And they are sinful. And they are mortal. And that is incredibly dangerous. We need help. Peter knows that. And all he wants for those who are reading his letter is have more of this. Have more, more grace, more peace with God than you already have. How do we get it? There's only one source, he says, in the knowledge of God, knowing God, knowing Jesus, our Lord. So you want to find free help? Press on to know the Lord. That's how you find free help. Know him. Get to know him. Pick up this book and read. Get to know your Savior. 
uh, and I love it. Verse 3, uh, in a lot of translations, you've got a, a big gap in a new section heading. Um, in the Greek, there's a little word at the beginning of uh, verse 3. It's, it's, uh, it's like the word like or as. Um, it's got a causal meaning to it. So he's just continuing. Uh, it, Peter is just a strange writer. He, he's got this introduction. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. That's not just trite words for Peter. He's already arguing, though we don't, we might not realize it. It's like, I hope you have more grace, more peace, because seeing as his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's the, the basis, the foundation for the hope that Peter has for the people he's writing to. They can have grace, increasing grace, multiplying grace and peace, because there is a God that can be known. And when you know him, you find out that his son, Jesus, gives you everything you need for life and godliness. And did you hear that? Life and godliness. Turns out, those are the two things that you and I need. Life for our mortality. Godliness for our wickedness. These are the things we need. And Jesus Christ has provided them. Godliness for your evil, life for your mortality. Jesus' power, which is God's power because Jesus is God, has given those of us who believe everything necessary for life and godliness. You could not provide it. So Jesus, the Messiah, provides it for you. And all you have to do is trust him. That's how you get it. Or as he puts it here, how do you get it? Through knowing of him who called us. Through knowledge of him who called us. Knowing Christ. This isn't just head knowledge, obviously. This is just knowing, truly knowing, believing, holding fast. In, in the last, uh, in the Sunday school hour, we, we read Romans uh, chapter 10. And it's, it's actually believing God at his word so that you actually call out to him for the help that he offers. God offers help. He's made it very clear here. If you will believe it and say, God, help me like, like you say you will says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. They will. They'll be saved. That's, that's how you get saved, is by believing in the Lord. And it's through these or by these that he has given to us his very precious and very great promises. Of course, Scripture is full of the wonderful promises of God. Peter doesn't highlight them all here. And this is what I mean. Peter is just inviting his readers to go and explore their Bibles. Go find some promises that you can cling to. There's many of them. If you don't know where to start, read, read Romans 8 for starters. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And the list he gives is massive. Nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, neither height nor depth, nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God. Jesus did this mighty work for us. He provided us with everything we need for life and godliness, and he did it with a goal in mind. His goal, as stated here in, in verse 4, by which he has granted to us his very great and precious promises, so that, there's the purpose, this is why he's doing it, why, is, why do we have these promises, why do we have life and godliness, what's the purpose, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So, if you are in Christ, you've escaped the vanity, the hopelessness, the seeming meaninglessness to everything that's in the world. You've received life and godliness, the two things that you need. And that this is truth number one for Peter, that you would know the sufficiency that comes from Christ, our Savior. He's sufficient. Everything you need, he has the help that you need. It's provided for you. And Jesus did this so that you may become more like God. That is the goal of Jesus calling you to his own glory and excellence, that you would look more like God. And that's where he goes next. Okay, this is verses 5 to 11. This is the hope that comes from holiness. Okay, so first he reminds them that they have everything they need for life and godliness. Because of all that Jesus has done, right, that's the sufficiency that comes from Christ. Now Peter reminds his audience of the second truth to help us make it, namely the hope 
that comes from holiness. And the logic goes like this. Because God has given you everything you need for life and godliness, because he has equipped you with his promises, for this reason, live godly lives. Let's read it. 2 Peter 1, 5-11. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and your election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A a lot of people, myself included, struggle with this question at some point in their lives. Am I saved? Am I saved? Is, is the grace and peace described in verse 2, is the life and godliness described in verse 3, are the promises in verse 4, are, do these apply to me or not? It's a massive question. And it's, it comes up in Papua New Guinea. It happens to missionaries like me. Um, I have not met a guy at Grace Bible Church who has not wrestled with this question at some point. Am I saved? And what God gives us here through the pen of Peter is a goal, a goal by which we can test ourselves. If you trust in Jesus, then regardless of your age or class, God has given you everything you need. Therefore, for this reason, supplement your faith. Supply it, furnish it, support it, add to it. Make every effort to do so. Put your whole self into this endeavor, Peter says. Supplement your faith by striving to do good. Supplement it with virtue, doing what's right. Add to that knowledge, seeking to know what's true, right? Knowing, knowing what's right, what's good, what's beautiful. And to knowledge, supply self-control, controlling yourself, controlling your desires, the ability to say no to yourself. Bolster your self-control with steadfastness. Persevere in that. Keep going. As you grow in steadfastness, add to that godliness, thinking God's thoughts after him, doing what brings God glory. To godliness, add brotherly affection. That's the love for the saints. Supply your brotherly affection with love, that sacrificial compassion for others, even our enemies. The picture here, you guys, is a pursuit of holiness. It's a pursuit. It's taking every aspect of our hearts and minds and making every effort to supply our faith with these virtues, these qualities, Peter calls them. And then... In this reminder comes a kind of test for believers to take. It's almost as if Peter is saying, God wants you to be godly. He has given you the power you need for godliness. So, check and see if this power is yours. If you pursue these qualities and find that they are yours and increasing, what a helpful word, means it's not perfected. You don't start off perfectly virtuous, perfectly doing all these things. In this life, this side of heaven, we are only going to grow from wherever we are. At whatever stage God saves you, he saves sinners when they're at the bottom. You only have up from there, and we're all at different stages in our growth. It's it's something that's increasing. But if these qualities are yours, and they are increasing, maybe slight incremental increases, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. And if there is no fruit, if you look at your life and there is no fruit, then there can be no confidence that Jesus' divine power has given you anything pertaining to godliness. Perhaps you've forgotten God's forgiveness. I mean, after all, didn't Jesus say, He who forgives little loves little? He or he who has been forgiven little loves little. If you haven't been forgiven, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, Living a godly life, you're just going to find it to be impossible. In other words, if you care little for the virtues that Peter has laid out, if you look at your life and it doesn't even begin to define you, well then what hope do you have that you're forgiven? Perhaps you're not. 
So these, these are eternal matters, and they are at stake for all of us. So Peter says, therefore, be diligent to confirm your calling and your election. In other words, check to see if you're saved. If you try to pursue these qualities, if you try, try to be virtuous, try to be self-controlled, try to say no to your flesh, no to your desires. Anyone struggle with that? Yeah? If you try, and you find that you're relying on your own strength and resources to live the Christian life, you're not relying on Christ, that life and godliness that he supplies in the gospel, then you are going to find that you will fail. And perhaps... Graciously, you'll come to the realization, I must not be saved. I must be trusting in my own godliness and morality and strength to get through this life. I, I need to repent, turn, trust the Lord Jesus. I, if that is you this morning, if you, if you look at this list and you're like, that does not describe me. There, there is a really dangerous road you could take, which is to just... Pull up your bootstraps, say, you know what? Uh, today I'm going to have self control. I'm going to do it. That is not the way to live the Christian life. That is just self righteousness. That road ends in death and discouragement. Don't follow that road. If you look at this list and you're like, man, these qualities, they just do not define me. Well, you know what the answer is? Go back to verse 3. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You want godliness? Go back to the one who gives it. Don't find the strength somewhere within yourself to do that. If the Lord permits you to reach repentance and to submit to him, he will give you the power needed for godliness. His divine power, his magnificent promises will grant you the strength that you need to have self-control and to say no to your sinful desires. And to do so again and again and again, and tomorrow and the next day. And as you do, he will give you grace to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And if these qualities are yours, and they're growing, not perfect every day, but if they're growing, this will not lead you to think, wow, I am such a good person. It won't. No, you know what's going to lead you to think? I'm saved. That's what Peter wants you to come to the conclusion. Confirm your calling and election. Being called, being elected is not something you do. We confirm it. Am I? Oh, yes, I am. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have saved me. I didn't deserve it. I was not deserving of free help, and you gave it to me. That should be our response. And if these qualities are yours and increasing, he writes next, they keep you from falling. What's falling? What's falling? Keep reading. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To fall is contrasted with making it into the kingdom. Godliness is a requirement for being with God. It's a requirement. And as one commentator put it, only God makes people godly. So if you want godliness in your life, you know who you need to go to. It's not yourself. You need to go to the Lord. This is the aim of every believer. You must know him, must please him, must honor him. The believer goes to him for the power to do so. That is the hope that comes from holiness. All right. And finally, we come to the certainty that comes from the scriptures. So Peter started by the sufficiency that comes from Christ. He is everything you need. He has all the help that you need. Then we saw the hope that comes from holiness, that as you grow in holiness, there's actually hope. You can know that you are saved, that you are called. And finally, this comes after the section that we read in the introduction. He says, these are the things I want you to remember. I'm going to die. And so I'm writing these things down so that after I'm gone, at any point, you can open this letter and remember these things. And that is where he goes finally, and that is the certainty that comes from the scriptures. You can have certainty. I know people dabble in the scriptures and use them to justify just about every interpretation under the sun. Um, I love what uh, Martin Luther said to um, his prosecutor, Cayetan. Uh, Martin Luther, of course, was like, man, the Pope does not seem to be reading his Bible. Like, 
I know he's supposed to be the head of the church, but this is what the Bible says, and I don't know what to do. And Kayatan said, it is the responsibility of the Pope to interpret scriptures, not you. And Martin Luther said, you know, the Pope may interpret the scriptures, but he is not above them. And that's true for you, too. You are not above the scriptures. You, you can interpret them however you want. The world does. There are so many interpretations out there. When you read Peter and what he says about the scriptures, it doesn't sound like he's like, yeah, the script, they're tough. You know, it can mean this, it can mean this. There's four views on this, four views on this, four views on this. Pick your view. That is not how this sounds. Okay, you ready? This is Peter addressing the certainty that comes from the scriptures. This is verses 16 to the end of the chapter. This is where we'll end. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, we, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and that voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves were there. We heard this voice born from heaven because we were with him on the holy mountain. We've got that, and, verse 19, we have the prophetic word, more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Truth is not found in cleverly devised myths. It's just not found. There are a lot of plausible beliefs out there. Some well thought out, some not so well thought out. There's many of them. But truth about Jesus' power, truth about his coming again, truth about what he's done is something else. It's not a clever possibility. It's just what's true, Peter says. It's, it's just what's true, and, and he knows it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he knows it because of two things. One is that he was an eyewitness. It's like, I'm not making this up. I was actually there, and I saw it. And number two, we have a prophetic word. Peter has hope in both of these things because he knows that both of these things came from God. This good news did not originate with Peter. God made Peter and the apostles eyewitnesses. Right? Peter didn't ask to join Jesus' cohort. Jesus just called him right out of his occupation. And he goes on to say how God did all that. He says, we were there with him on the mountain. God told us himself, this is my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. This is the one to listen to. He's like, I was standing there, and God himself told me, this is it. And the apostles have something else. They have a prophetic word. Um, in verse 19, and we have the prophetic word. I think that word, we, there, that pronoun, we, who is that talking about? Is that all of us? I don't think so. I think he just said, we ourselves heard this very, in verse 18, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. Who's that we? Obviously the apostles, right? And he, he just doesn't change. And we, the apostles, have a prophetic word. More fully confirmed and very helpful, to which you will do well to pay attention. So, apostolic word, and there's you that need to pay attention to this. The apostles were prophets, speaking from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And as they preached this word... They wrote down this word, it's in Gospels, it's in historical accounts, it's in the letters. This word is certain, this word is true, it's confirmed, this word is the seal of God's approval. It is, in fact, God's word. It's his. Right? That's that, What conclusion can you come to in verse 21? No prophecy, no prophecy was ever produced by something in man, a desire in man. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say what's going to happen next. No true prophecy ever comes from the will of man, but men were speaking from God. 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is God's Word. Therefore, it's not open to just anyone's interpretation. That's verse 20. Know this, first of all. No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. You may interpret the Bible, but you are not above it. The Bible means what God meant when he wrote it. And Peter's confident that you can read the Scriptures and know it, even though they're sometimes hard to understand. Uh, quickly turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, uh, chapter 3, verse 15. Count the patience of the Lord as salvation, brothers, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. Amen? Yeah, there's hard things. They're not easy to understand. But those things, the ignorant and unstable, twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So Peter knew, Paul's writing scripture, not easy to understand. That does not give you a right to twist it and interpret it and make it mean what you want it to mean. You just can't do that. That's what unstable, twisted people do, and they're destroyed. Peter knows that scriptures can be read and truth can be discerned, and you can have certainty, confidence, that what is there is actually true. Peter points out here that it's also more fully confirmed. And man, I've heard a bunch of interpretations on this. We have the prophetic word, more fully confirmed. Does that mean it's more reliable than Peter's eyewitness? Or uh, is it uh, a lot of different interpretations here? What I've landed on here is that in the context, it seems like, well, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, But false prophets are going to arise among the people, and they're going to lead you away with secret, destructive heresies. They're going to deny the Master. There's going to be all these different voices that are out there, but we have a word more fully confirmed. I think he's just contrasting the Bible with every other solution that man has to offer. It's more fully confirmed. It's trustworthy. It's more reliable than any sweet promise the world can conjure up and give you. It's more reliable than anyone who offers you the freedom to do whatever you want. Say just say the words, I love Jesus, and then go live just like the rest of the world. You'll be fine. That is just a cleverly devised myth. There's tempting lies. Give in to your desires. You'll be happy. You just need to love yourself more. Leave behind God's laws. That's slavery. Just live a little. Be free. Flee the restraints of holiness. Be like God. Isn't that what Satan said? You'll be like God. God knows it and he's keeping it from you. You know the way to be more like God? Disobey him. That fruit that he said don't eat it? Get after it. That's where happiness is. False teachers do the same thing in 2 Peter 2, 18-19. He says, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions. The senses, right? Nice tastes, nice touches, nice smells, nice sights. The passions of the flesh, and they entice those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. These false teachers, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. I mean, do you hear it? Speaking they entice, promising they deceive, but are, but are enslaved. Peter is saying, don't listen to them. They're lying to you. Those clever myths will destroy you. So who should you listen to? To this prophetic word from the apostles. You do well to pay attention. I mean, don't you want to do well? Uh, there's nowhere else that you can go to find words of eternal life than here. You want to do well? Come to the Word of God. If you neglect this Word, or abandon this Word, or tamper with this Word, or negotiate with this Word, you will lose your life, both in this life and the next. You don't want that. It's not going to go well with you. You do well when you pay attention to this Word. And here's how to pay attention to it. Pay attention to it, he says. Um, You do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. How helpful light is in darkness. 
Light helps you get things done. Light helps you get your bearings. Light helps you find your way. Light helps you look for dangers. Darkness, true darkness, is dreadful without light. It's a dark world out there. And this word is the lamp. Pay attention to this word for how long? That's the next question. For how long? Pay attention to this word until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I think this is a classic phrase, one of those things that's just hard to understand on a first read. If you're just picking up your Bible and you come across the phrase, uh, trust in this word until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. You'd be like, what? What the world is going on there? And I think this is one of those phrases, one of those details of the Bible that's worth exploring. Pick up your Bible and read. Figure out, what's he talking about here? I'm, I'm going to give you my best guess. I'm not going to show you how I came up with it uh, entirely, but I'm going to give you my best guess, and you can test it out as you read your Bibles. I think the day dawning and the morning star rising in your hearts is a reference to the Lord's returning to have his day on the earth. I mean, isn't that what Peter said in the beginning in, uh, in verse uh, 16 of chapter 1? Uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Um, we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then at the end of the letter in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens are going to pass away with a roar. Heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's the day when Jesus has his day on earth. And Peter says, pay attention to the word until you see the Lord face to face. Pay attention to the word until the word himself shows up. That's the encouragement here. So wh where are you going to go when you have to figure out this life? Where are you going to go when you have doubts? Um, are you going to look to your own interpretation of things? Are you going to go and find the wisdom of others? Because look, you can find people to assuage just about any fear you have, at least temporarily. There's a lot of people who will tell you how to make sense of the word. When you need hope, there will be people who tell, who point you to political hopes, or maybe financial ones. When you feel guilty because of sin, there's going to be people who will tell you that it's not your fault. You're a victim. When you're scared of death, there will be people to tell you that it's just going to be all right in the end. God saves everybody. Like the snake in the garden, they'll boldly say, you surely won't die. First lie recorded in Scripture. A lie that God won't punish sin. When he clearly said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, Satan is the father of cleverly devised myths. He's the father of lies, and there's lots of them out there. But there is also rock-solid truth. And we need to remember it. We need to remember that Jesus Christ is our sufficiency. We need to remember the great salvation purchased for us by Christ. That his divine power has given to us the godliness we desperately need in our sin. He's given us the life that we desperately need in our frail and mortal bodies. We need to remember the hope that comes from pursuing holiness. That we can find assurance that God is at work within us. We need to remember that there is certainty in the scriptures. We can test everything in this world by this word, and we can find real, solid hope for this life and the next. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. What a joy it has been for me to stand in front of these dear saints and just remember with them the hope that is in your God, your word is true, it is excellent, it is trustworthy, and God, we don't worship the Bible. We worship you, and you have revealed yourself in the Bible. We love the Bible because of who it points us to. We love the Bible because of the real truth, the good message that's there, that we, in the pit of our sin, in our rebellion, can find a good physician to heal us, to help us, to provide us with the help that we do not deserve. And we don't have to pay for it. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to fix our mess. 
before we come to you. Lord, we just need to know who you are, what you've done, that you're trustworthy. We need to call on you, and you will save us. Lord, that is just such good news. And I pray it would encourage us as we minister at the ends of the earth, whether we're in St. George, Utah, or Papua New Guinea. God, we need these truths to endure and to make it to the end. Would you be with us and help us to do just that, to make it to the end? And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.